Yeah, we okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Um, I, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our first ISR distinguished speaker uh, of this year and, and also the uh, informatics seminar speaker, um, Professor Prem Devenbu. He's a professor at UC Davis in the computer science department. Um, this is the part where I give all of his laudatory accomplishments. Um, <laughs> He is an ACM uh, fellow as of 2018. He has, uh, I was going through all the lists, like so many best paper, distinguished papers, um, several here are most influential papers and test of time uh, awards. Like it's, 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 it's clear that like, his work is being a, a, a acknowledged and received well in the current time, but also then we look back and it's like, oh wow, this is like, uh, change research that really changed the course of um, how people did research from then forward. Um, ACM uh, SIGSOFT Outstanding Research Award. He's also been the general chair of FSC and program chair for FSC and ICSI. Um, and he's also on the editorial board for all, just about all the, the journals over, over the years. So um, really honored to have uh, Professor Devin Boo here to speak to us. So. Thank you. Thank you. That's a um, and it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I've actually visited several times. If you're, I, I keep saying, if you work in software engineering in California, you just can't stay away from Irvine for too long. Mm -hmm. uh, so, later. so it's really a pleasure to be here and thank you for, for inviting me. There we go. Okay. So, I, you know, to begin this talk, I have to thank a, a large group of people that are my students and colleagues from, UC, from computer science uh, in software engineering and other areas. So, so there's a you know bioinformatics person here, Vladimir Kultov, and there's a linguist here, Emily Morgan. So a lot of great people, and it's been really fun to work with them over the years. So this this work would not have been possible without any of them. And as the saying goes, you know, if there's any mistakes in the talk, it's entirely my fault. So okay, so um, so right, so I'm going to start with naturalness. You notice the, the title of the talk had two things: naturalness and bimodality. So what is naturalness, right? So some of you have seen this before. So uh, the first 10 minutes are just sort of a broad introduction to the research area. Then I'll get into the stuff, the new stuff that we're doing right now, which relates more to bimodality than to naturalness. Right, so, you know, so the idea starts from the fact that like human languages have evolved to meet natural needs of communication. So spoken and written English have human needs. And so this work began with the observation that code actually, sorry, whoops, <laughs> that I go past. Code actually is there to, uh, in fact, meet the same kinds of needs. Uh, that is, it's also really uh, primarily a, kind of a vehicle for human communication, right? So, um, so, so why is that language what we call natural, and, and what exactly does that mean, right? So, human beings communicate, uh, you know, in the presence of uh, noise, danger, and you know, distractions. And you know, despite uh, all that, you know, if, uh, you know, I have an accent. You have an accent. Uh, whatever kind of uh, English you learn to speak, you have an accent. So, you know, in spite of all this, we're able to communicate, right? So why does that actually work, right? Um, it's because natural languages is used a repetitive, predictable, predictable to statistical model. The natural and the sort of the repetitive, predictable part is kind of like a social construct. It's just the way we learn to speak to each other so we can communicate more effectively and even in the presence of noise and distractions, right? But as it turns out, you know, Quite capable of modeling this, the, the natural language. And from this sort of computational property of natural languages has emerged a whole range of really useful tools that we use every day and, you know, many cases cannot really avoid. Um, so so um, the point in our case is that code, you know, even though code was developed by our brothers and sisters in programming languages to serve a particular purpose, which is the formal act of communication between a human being and a computer, um, that's really what where they came from. You know, we software engineers, we know that really the sort of, in some sense, the most important purpose of code is to communicate the intent of a computation to a colleague, right? Because the colleague is the one who's going to maintain the code and make sure it's doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, and this particular line of communication is decidedly not formal. Most human beings don't act like computers in the reading code. So, um, so you have to sort of like... Um, uh, you know, kind of uh, design the way you write your programs to facilitate communication with other human beings the same way you choose to express your to communicate with other human beings, right? So, you know, while a computer is going to not care if, a, you know, a tiger is wandering the hallways of the cloud, uh, 
you know, a human being is not the same, right? So if a human being is looking at some code, they're going to get distracted by noise, by angry bosses, by video games, you know, so this, the same situation applies. Um, so that's, that's kind of like the, the key observation is that there's basically two channels that code operates in, and one of them is noisy. The other one is completely reliable, right? So if you write code, the computer knows exactly what it means every time, always, right? So, but it's not the same for human beings. Right, so, um, so despite having formal semantics, uh, code as it's usually written is an amenable to statistical modeling. So there's a, a few series of papers that touch on this angle, um, you know, in XC near, and then a couple of cognitive science conferences. Right, and so, you know, one sort of simple way to, to think about this is like the code the variable i is very ordinary and mundane to everybody, but the code on the right is weird, right? Uh, it means exactly the same thing, but you know it is it is weird, right? Um, no, you know most people wouldn't write that, right? So the question is, how do you use this naturalness? And this has been kind of what has been occupying us since for for pretty much ten years now, right? Um, so you know, so yes, absolutely, <laughs> you can use this. And so you know, you, the main use of this that we've been exploiting and, and our work, you know, that's been is mostly about building tools. Um, but there's another whole side to it, which is experimental science, and I'll get to that towards the end. Um, so, right. So, you know, well, how does that mean, right? So a programmer has a need for a tool, you know, and they decide they need maintenance or, you know, common synthesis or whatever it is they need a tool for. Uh, and they go off and write it. This is sort of the way they always have done it. Um, and then, you know, this tool can be run over source code, and then you get some results, right? Um, so the construction, you know, is, is, has some limitations. Most of them have to arise, arise from like, you know, algorithmic limitations and resource limitations, right? Because you can't completely tell without running the code what it's going to do. It's a basic property of programs and desirability. So, so there's always some kind of limitation in tools like this, right? So ideally, you know, this doesn't always happen, but ideally um, what we'd like is that, you know, We'd like to take advantage of this enormous corpus of code that's out there in GitHub. You know, there's a billion tokens easily in GitHub. And you know, this tells you a lot about the way people write code, right? So if you believe some tool is difficult to build or costly to build, it may be theoretically true. The actual code that's out there that people actually write, it may not be really that difficult to do, right? So you want to leverage that in some fashion. So you know, the whole line of work that's been up to is to sort of take this large code corpus build some kind of statistical model, right? And then building. And, you know, so this modeling now these days, I mean, what, do you, what kind of model do you want? You can, there's so much flexibility in, in modeling that's available to people because of deep learning that there's a lot of different things, kinds of things you can do. You want sequential models. You want like models that summarize a lot of data. You want like models of pictures, models of videos, whatever you want, you know, there's architectures. How do you want to train them? There's a million different ways to train them, right? So because of the dynamism of this underlying field of deep learning, there's lots of flexibility in how you go about doing this. Right, so, um, so that's kind of the, the sort of the, the basic vision. And just to give you an idea of some of the things you can do, you can classify code, right? You can find clones, you can try and find if code is buggy or not. Um, uh, you can rank code, you know, you can say, you know, I want code to corpus and rank them. Uh, one of the things you're doing right now is basically taking um, un previously unseen binaries and trying to find code that's related to the binaries. That's a project we have with um, Sandia National Labs, their cyber defense group. You know, you can prioritize search. Uh, if you're doing some kind of analysis that involves search, you can prioritize the search using probabilities. Uh, so there's lots of different kinds of categories of applications. Um, so the sort of the, the papers where we kind of laid out our vision for the field was published in XC 2012. And then subsequently, there's been a couple of longer papers that sort of like stretch out this vision in, in, in to a greater extent. The, if you want to get started in this area, this computing surveys paper is very good. Um, uh, it was written by a PhD student from um, Edinburgh. And it's, it's a really nice paper. It's a very long survey. OK, so um, right. So you know, for, you know, there's a simple example, right? So you know, every IDE has code suggestion, right? And now the these nowadays have very, very fancy code suggestion tools, right? So, you know, so that is a very simple idea is like, you know, you want to model a conditional distribution of the next token given the context. 
Um, and so, you know, to do this, uh, you develop a trainable version of lots of code that tells you what the next token should be given the context. Anything in GitHub is useful training data. So then you just go off and find a, you know, function operator. What do you want? There's like so many different kinds these days, right? Pick one and, and train it. Um, and, um, and then, you know, once you've got the model trained, uh, then you develop some way of evaluating how well this model is working. So you could do a top five position recall, you could do mean reciprocal rank. Um, and then you've got yourself, you know, potentially a tool that is measurable and potentially useful uh, in, in a practical setting. Right? So it's all about like, um, all about like kind of trying to come up with the right, right pro conditional probability and the right kind of approximator for this conditional property. Um, there's been a whole slew of, by the way, if you have any questions, please just, I'm happy to take questions in the middle. So just ask. Um, so, you know, there's lots of uh, these kinds of conditional probabilities one could write down and try to model. Um, so, you know, the simplest one is like, is this code reasonable in some sense of reasonable? Is this weird? Is this bad? You know, so it might be just straight probability of code, right? So you can use it to check code in some way. Um, may or may not be useful, but they're just putting that up as, a, as an example, right? And then we saw about this code suggestion thing. Um, another example might be like, variable name recovery. So this is important when you're doing any kind of reverse engineering work. Um, you're trying to figure out, you know, in a, from a binary, you know, what is this binary doing? A lot of useful information in, in there is in the variable names or the method names. So you might want to try to recover that. Um, you might have obfuscated JavaScript, you want to recover the names. So that, you know, that's another kind of thing you can do. Um, you can try to recover types. Um, you know, many programming languages these days so they, you can write the program with no types and gradually add type annotations. And the more type annotations you add, the more checking you get. So, you know, so that's another kind of um, application. All of these, you know, have this, this fair body of work. You know, it's at least half a dozen to a dozen papers in any of these things. Um, you know, another thing you could do is repair. You have a lot of data in, in GitHub on how people repair code. And so you could try to build a model of, New code given the old code that was that you're trying to patch. Um, you know, you could try to summarize code, right? So, given some code, what is this thing doing in English, right? So, again, lots of data available because you have comments uh, or, or uh, function descriptions or comment log messages. Any of these are relevant to this task. Uh, you could also try to do code retrieval or code synthesis, right? Given an English description, try to produce code. So, some of the newer, you know, big media splashes have been on models you can actually. Know, synthesize code given some English description. Finally, do task assignments, right? So it's like, you know, you have a piece of code that you have to patch or add some features to who should work on this. You can try to find who should be the best person. Yeah. So, you know, so this is a rich area. We ourselves have done a bunch of work uh, on this and, you know, the last several years, um, um, program understanding, uh, you know, different kinds of modeling, including graphical models, um, um, code patching, code summarization, binary analysis. So there's a lot of work and it, overall in the field there's, you know, it's been an explosion of interest and there's, you know, probably over a thousand papers in this field. All the major software houses have, have, um, have groups in the area. Uh, NSF has funded uh, a, a proposal, uh, several of our proposals and several from others. Um, DARPA had a competition on this area. So, you know, so there's a lot of work going on. It's a very active area. So, um, so, so that's sort of the context of the, where our new work starts. Um, so we just set medium to fund this bimodality work. Um, so that's what I'll be talking about for the rest of the talk. Any questions so far? Okay, we'll keep going. All right, okay, so, um, right. So this is what I mean by bimodality. All right, okay. So, um, so what is that? All right, so, so it starts with this sort of assumption, right? So when a programmer writes code, they're trying to get it to work somewhere on a computer. So that's the sort of this, this kind of formal channel, right? Uh, where the meaning of the code is a mathematical function of the syntax of the code, right? So it's a precisely defined invariant mathematical function of the code. Always means the same thing, doesn't matter how you write it. You know, there's different ways to write the same code. It's well-defined, right? Uh, and the natural channel, the human is reading the code and trying to figure out what it means, right? So 
so when the human reads it, you know, they're, they're using information that is latent in identifier names, comments, in coding styles, all these things tell something to the reader about the code itself, right? The human almost never uses the formal channel, right? It's like, it, they'll use it when they have to, but otherwise it's like, you know, they're not a computer. So they'll, they're, they're gonna mostly rely on this sort of informal channel to read code. Um, so, you know, so this, this is, this is, you know, this is where we have this sort of probabilistic pathway going on. So let me just explain what I'm writing down here, right? So what is actually going on, you know, uh, is that the human being is estimating some meaning of the chord, which has the highest probability. So given the chord that I'm looking at, what is the most likely meaning, right? So that's what the human being is trying to do, right? So for the computer, there's one meaning, which is pro with probability one, and every other meaning has probability zero, right? For the human being, it's not like that. They can misunderstand code, right? Just like they can, they can misunderstand English, they can also misunderstand traditional interpretation of the code, gi given, given the code, right? So, um, so, so if you'll indulge me, I, I just wanna step through a kind of like sort of standard noisy channel interpretation of what this means. It's, this is actually going somewhere. This is not just, right? Uh, what I'm hoping to convince you when I end up with this little bit of derivation is that that there is an actual kind of reasonable model, which we haven't validated, but it's a reasonable model of how people read code, right? How people read and understand code, right? So it's 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 at, at, it's not completely validated theory, although although some pieces of it are validated, as you'll see when I, when I finish the second part of this bit. Um, but it's it's still mostly a sort of an appealing theory. At least I think it's appealing, right? So you know, so if you take the standard Bayesian uh, Bayesian rewrite of that of that thing, it's you know it's basically the, the standard Bayesian formula, right? In the Bayesian formula, the denominator is the chord, and then you have p meaning on top, and then you have uh, the reverse condition, which is chord giving you reading of it, right? So since the chord is already there, right? So you're given some chord, you can sort of think about this argmax as being this argmax. That is, the chord doesn't matter once your chord is written, right? So that's the kind of thing we're working with, right? And of course, this, so basically what we're saying is there's some meaning the programmer imagines with the probability. And then they're saying, is this code most likely given that meaning, right? And then, then they're, they've, got, they've got a maximum pro product, right? So they're not gonna think of some code that, some meaning, computational meaning that is not relevant to the current setting, right? And, then, and they're gonna think of the most likely way a hum, natural or reasonable human being would write this code given that meaning. And they'll take this product and maximize it, and then that gives them the most likely meaning, right? So that's what they're most likely to do. Um, so you know, and of course, you know, the meaning depends on the context. So you can rewrite this in to say that, uh, given the context, so let's say they're looking at financial programs, right? Then they're expecting to see certain size, so kinds of computations in the financial world. That would be to see. Then they're trying to see is is the implementation I'm looking at the most likely one given that meaning, right? So this is sort of the setting we're looking at. Right? So you know, this is sort of meant to be a kind of a sort of an, uh, a, a, a way to imagine how people just to make that more clear. Let me just bang on that a little bit, right? So the idea is you're imagining a meaning that is a particular computation given the context in which you're operating, right? So that's this first, the rightmost conditional uh, probability. And then you're say, asking yourself, given that, what is the most likely code elements I would see, right? So imagine maybe something like, okay, this person is trying to calculate some, you know, some, some options contract price in some financial setting. I think that's what this code is doing. And then I might say, okay, if they're trying to calculate the options price setting in this context, I'm just making this stuff up, right? So then I'm gonna use the most likely algorithm we're gonna use is this particular algorithm, right? So, so that algorithm's implementation should have this kind of a loop and then this kind of an if variable names because that's the formula they're using. So I expect to see this kind of terms. Maybe there's some Fourier transform, who knows? But so maybe I expect to see some things having to do with Fourier transforms in the code. Um, and then I see that in the code and then I say, okay, that's probably what this is. That's sort of how most people read code. I mean, because most of the time you're in a hurry, you don't have a lot of time to figure out what's going on, right? You're just sort of trying to get a good sense of what the code does, right? So that's how we sort of get a sense of what this code does. And oops, sorry. Um, and then you match, you know, your expected things with a given code. And if it matches, then you, you know, you're a fundamental, right? And if you fail, then you first go back and say, oh, maybe they did it 
not that way, but some other slightly different way. So let me see if that works. You try a different, guess a different implementation and see if that matches. And if none of that works, then you go back and, you know, and, and then you guess again, right? So, you know, and if all else fails, then you painfully step through the code and like, you know, like using operational semantics, right? And that would, in most cases, is the last resort for a human being to do that. Right? Most of the time you're trying to guess meaning from this way. Um, so, and the long, the more times you have to go through this loop, right? In other words, the more unlikely the computation in that setting, and the more unlikely the way to implement that, the more time you're gonna to take to read it, right? So this is kind of like, you know, it gives you a good sense of why people really write code the sort of the standard expected way, because if you don't do that, you're gonna make it life difficult for everybody. Right? So, you know, the, none of this is surprising. It's just sort of, you know, I, I, I like this way of thinking about it because it sort of fits code reading into a very nice kind of noisy channel model. Okay, so, um, so what's the bimodality hypothesis, right? So the bimodality hypothesis is that like, there's this formal channel, right, that code has. And this is lovely because as our programming language friends tell us, you can do static analysis, you can do type theory, you can do optimization, you can do meaning preserving transforms on the code. You know, you can do all this cool stuff with code because code has these formal mathematical tools us to compile it automatically, check for errors, all kinds of cool stuff, right? Um, now this natural, in, uh, natural channel enables probabilistic modeling. And what this gives us is the ability to exploit the fact that people don't write code any data that are in a very predictable way, right? So this allows us to sort of kind of take advantage of that side as well, right? And this idea of, of, um, of, of, of bimodality is that these two actually have a lot of synergies that one can exploit. Right? It's, it's two aspects of code have a lot of synergies that we should try to exploit. When we try to use static analysis tools to make them better, we can use probabilistic models. When you wanna use probabilistic models, when you wanna train them or when you wanna uh, use them for some purpose. We can take advantage of the fact that code is not natural language; that's formal semantics. Right? So, uh, so this is our new initiative that you know that we just got funded by the NSF. Um, so, um, so, so I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples of this stuff, and if you're interested in this, we can talk offline as well. Um, so one example that I'll show you in this talk um, is how you can create data using the formal channel, right? So, you know, for some tasks, you know. Uh, you know, the, it can be expensive to take, uh, to label images, for example. You need a human being to label the images for you, right? In software engineering, you don't need a human. You can certainly synthetically generate large amounts of data using this formal channel, right? Um, uh, another, another example of this is like, you know, what I showed you earlier is like, you know, this theory of how program understanding works. Because of the existence of the formal channel, you can create experimental, material, right, samples, experimental samples uh, for doing linguistic sort of traditional experiments in psycholinguistics with human subjects. You know, whereas linguists have a hard time constructing these kinds of samples in code, it's very easy to do that. Okay, so that's kind of the framework of the rest of the talk. Right, so first thing I'm gonna talk about is this problem of linear parsing and how we can create training data for that, right? So, you know, beginning Beginning programmers do this. Uh, and the idea of the problem is to take this through some. Uh, Train it is using an algorithm, right? So we have correct source code. We start with correct source code, uh, and then we feed it to you know any kind of parse that you can get uh, um, off the off the shelf, and then you get uh, ASTs, which are abstract syntax trees representing the code, and plus you get types, right? So the Java code, for example, you can get the associated types, right? So by the way, when you're dealing with incorrect code, it can be helpful to have both the syntax and the types, right? So if you're trying to base something from Stack Overflow. You'd like to guess what the types are 
so the IDE can benefit from you know, from the type information and know how to paste the code in, right? Okay, so this is kind of like exploiting the formal channel, right? So then what we can do is we can take these, sorry, we can take this data that is the aligned pairs of source code and ASD types and feed them to a transformer-based sequence-to-sequence learner, right? And then what we get is a parser, right? So this parser is not an algorithm, it's a trained parser, right? So these things actually work, this particular step actually works reasonably well. It's actually a known feature from natural language. Uh, so people have, there used to be a lot of parsing algorithms in the old days, but you know, people now have realized that you can actually train a parser you know, instead of using a parsing algorithm. Right. So this is the basic thing we start with. Now, of course, what we can do is, you know, so, so again, that's the natural channel that we, that we leverage. And so what this thing learns is this conditional distribution of the syntax tree given the code. Okay, so now what we can do is we can play games. We can take the source code and ideally we train a noiser that adds noise based on how noise is present in, in student code. So if you have a large corpus of student code where students have fixed the errors, then you can go backwards and train a noiser that adds noise the same way students added noise, right? So you can add a bunch of noise to this code. So now what you have is matched pairs of noisy source code, right? Bad source code and actual parses, right? So, so then you have, uh, then in this, in this kind of trick, you'll essentially learn a linear parser that can fix, fix bugs in, in, you know, the kind of defects or errors that students tend to make, right? Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of what we did. So again, you can see the sort of the benefit of using the formal channel and the natural channel uh, together to, to create enormous volumes. Whatever amount of data you want, because there's so much code on GitHub, you can just create huge volumes and you can take an extremely high capacity model, you know, 16 layer transformer, whatever you want, right? Um, and then and train this up, right? So, I mean, it, it still runs into some limitations, uh, mainly because uh, the this again goes to the differences between natural language and code in that um, the errors in code have very wide windows, you know? So in other words, to know how to fix a, an error in a particular region of code, you may have to look at code that's like hundreds of tokens before or hundreds of tokens after. This is typically not a problem in natural language, right? In, in most natural language processing, you're not dealing with like very wide windows of English text, right? That's kind of a, you know, sort of a persistent problem in, in using transformer or any kind of machine learning based methods uh, for sequential data and code is that the windows that these techniques give you is not that big. Right, so, so we had to find a way around this and an interesting engineering fix for this. So essentially the, the, we, we decided that there were like basically two kinds of repairs that we needed to perform on student or stack overflow code, more student code because stack overflow code is usually not that big. Um, one of them had to do with the nesting properties of code. That is how the curly braces are there. And the other has to do with like errors, local errors, errors in individual lines of code. Right. Most of the time, long distance errors tend to be errors in nesting in code. So we just essentially train two models, one model that fixes nesting errors, another model that fixes local errors. So the local error fixer is called frag fix, the other one's called block fix, right? So the pipeline essentially is that we go through the block fix and come up, and then we use the repaired nesting to break up the program into an ostensible set of fragments. You know, the fragments may not be correct because the block fix may not be correct, but we kind of assume it is, and we break it up into these uh, put, uh, fragments that may have errors in them. Fragments, and we take these two, and and then and then we can come up with uh, we can come up with the correct fix, right? And then finally, the fixed fragments are merged into the final source code using the spans. So so this is the pipeline. There's some there's a new version of the pipeline that's currently under review um, that actually takes advantage of error messages from the compiler. Um, so uh, that's not being reviewed in a blinded source. I don't mind saying that <laughs> it's a review for a journal. Uh, so, um, so okay. So that's that's kind of uh, where this where this thing ended up. Um, and you know, it's so you know, we did a lot of performance measurements. Um, so for Stack Overflow fragments, um, you know, the the modern, the very best modern IDEs. Um, if you, you know, you can sort of take the fragment, wrap it in an artificial function, you know, begin end function and then tell them to parse it and they will, and they succeed about 70% of the 70% of the time. Um, our thing can parse 90% of the 
but without any wrapping. It just takes them and parses them and gives you a tree. And that's because it's used to the idea of like receiving bits of code and parsing them. Uh, and you know, so uh, bad IDEs cannot really do anything about typing stack overflow fragments because I've never seen them before. They don't see any declarations. You know, and ours is pretty good. I mean, so you know, that's sort of the performance variation in our setting. Um, so you know, this there's three categories here. One is Android API types, then there's core Java, uh, and then like so the most widely used types. So it does best on the most widely used types, the hundred most widely used types, and then next best performance in core Java, and then Android is you know 50-50, half times the guess is wrong. So that's how it does for typing. Um, it's uh, performance in student code is. Is, is, is quite a bit better. So our latest iteration fixes on average about 75% of single token errors. And again, the problem I mentioned with length, right? So the performance declines for longer students. You know, we can fix programs at about 50% rate up to a thousand tokens. And, you know, for shorter programs up to hundred tokens, you do much better, but you know, when it gets very long, it starts, its performance starts to suffer. Okay, so um, so this is sort of the, the summary of summary slide of this portion of the talk. You know, the idea again is like we have this sort of opportunity for doing bimodal training, right? So you use the algorithm to generate noisy, noisy code AST pairs, and then you probabilistically parse them using the probabilistic channel you learn to parse them, and this way you end up with a parser that's quite lenient. Yes. Um, I uh, I can ask about the Android fifty. Yeah, yeah. Um, what do you think is making that particular harder to get accuracy? Yeah, I think it's basically sample size. You know, it's like it's just the, the most frequent ones it's able to learn better, the less frequent ones. It just hasn't seen as many examples. It doesn't do it better. Any questions? All right. So um, any other questions on this portion of the talk? And the next portion of the talk is a psychology experiment that I'll describe. Yeah. Uh, since you mentioned the sample size, what were the sample sizes that were working here? In, in, in uh, so I, I don't know the exact numbers. I don't, don't have them in, in my memory, but I would say 10 to hundreds of millions of code fragments from GitHub. Okay, 10 to, to hundreds of millions. And, in the, so, uh, and we would consider, for instance, dimensions, the tokens, right? So you would have. Yeah, so, so it's like with the size varies from. So, so for the training fragments, you know, it's we try to train with a large variety of uh, sizes, um, and you know, but in 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 that, so this is the the this the the I should have said this earlier. The tool is evaluated on the BlueJ data set, which is a data set of student Java code from uh, from UK. Um, it's freely available. You have to sign some forms to get. It. So that's what it's tested on. So that in the training, you know, we just use uh, the GitHub fragments to train. Yeah. I guess the, 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 the thing that kind of jumped out to me is you, you introduced this concept of a noiser, right. um, which adds noise into code in the way that students actually write code. Right, right, right. So there's like kind of a, a naturalness to the box. Right, in a right, sense. right, right. Um, I wonder, like, you know, there's this whole field of um, mutation testing, right. which adds in algorithmic errors into, into programs, but then there's always the debate of, you know, are mutate mutations of a real mistakes that people actually make? Right. And if we could do kind of a natural mutation automatically to do mutation testing with more natural Bugs automatically and assess the strength of our test suite in a similar way. Right. So, you know, so so in this case, right, the you know, it was sort of like, you know, what, what they call a graduate student descent. The the noiser that we built is, you know, it's not stochastic gradient descent, it's graduate student descent. So the student, the PC student, took the Gottman did this, took some portion of the student board, stared at the bugs for a while and said, Oh, this is the noise that I'm gonna build. Well, okay. So he built it. I mean, gotcha. you know, he was careful not to look at all of it. So there's some data left over for, you know, we're not overfitting the data. There's some data left over we can look at, right? But if you were to train a model on this, so you set aside some portion of the student error code and train it, that could totally be done, you know. Right. So on this. Now the question you're asking is about not syntax errors, but about bugs. Right. Right. To do that, you'd have to find bugs in code 
And you have to make sure that when you inject the mutation using this model, the mutations were compilable, right? So it produced code that compiles and, and, and then also, you know, can okay. So if you could do that, I mean, that sounds like an interesting approach. There is some work, you know, Mark Harmon and company, I mean, you, you're more familiar with this than I am, but there's some work that sort of shows that mutation, mutation, bugs and mutations are well coupled with actual bugs, yeah. So in certain contexts, yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So I'll just plow ahead into this new part of the work that we just recently have been up to. Um, so this is, you know, sort of starting with the sort of bimodal view of code reading. So this work is entirely in collaboration with my colleague uh, Emily Morgan at the Department of Psychology. She's joint appointment between psychology and linguistics. Um, so this, you know, this part of the work, and if she hasn't seen the slide, goofy in here is entirely my fault. So, uh, <laughs> so, so, uh, so, so. Anyway, so th this work is kind of like um, is I, I'm very excited about this because it's uh, it's essentially kind of like um, ideas that came out of you know, really series of conversations that Emily and I had about like, you know, she does work on on English reading. Um, and, I, and I saw her talk in, a, in, a, in a, there's a linguistics reading group at, at psycholinguistics reading group at Davis that I go to. So I saw her talk and I thought it was really fascinating. So we had a long series of conversations and out of that came this idea, you know, that, you know, maybe we could develop a model for code reading based on this, again, sort of same theory of national, um, uh, rational speech act theory and, and, uh, and, you know, and communicating at a noisy channel model, Shannon's noisy channel model. And so then we started, you know, uh, and th that sort of went into uh, the most recent work we're doing. Okay, so, you know, so the idea here is, you know, just to sort of like recap this, right, that there's, you know, for the formal channel at the bottom, you know, who cares? Computer doesn't really care. It won't mean exactly the same damn thing, right? Um, but for the human being, the one on the right is just really weird, right? So, you know, is, is that, you know, is that, how, so it turns out in psychological in, uh, uh, interest in the study of language, right? So there's this whole theory called rational speech act theory, which is basically what I mentioned earlier, that people express themselves in ways so that the speaker can maximize in his own mind, the probability that the listener is gonna understand what the speaker is saying, right? So speaker is talking to the listener, they don't know what's actually going on in the mind of the listener. The speaker doesn't know, but the speaker can, in their own head, you know, formulate this hypothesis about what, how they would say something, so that the listener understands them. Right. So, so we sort of, you know, worked out, you know, kind of how that might map in this world. In the natural language world, if you want to do experiments in this, you have to be able to construct in your experimental setting several different ways of saying the same thing in English. You know, it's not really, you know, Emily used these examples of bread and butter and butter and bread in her thesis. But as she herself says, butter and bread doesn't actually mean the same thing as bread and butter. Somebody might say something like that. Right? Would you like a little butter with your bread? You know, if you're like huge slabs of butter on your bread, they might say, would you like a little butter with your bread, right? <laughs> it's not the same as saying bread and butter. Right? But in code, these two are exactly the same damn thing. It doesn't really matter from a computer's perspective, right? They mean exactly the same thing. So, so it's possible to construct these kinds of equally, semantically equivalent member, uh, readings for a computer. Um, and then we can do these kinds of studies to see how much these affects uh, readability for humans. So for the psycholinguist, this is kind of really cool because this allows these, this, the, the affordances of uh, you know, semant meaning preserving transformation allows a whole set of experiments that are, can be done with language, natural language, but it's more difficult. Okay, so the idea here is of the formal channel enable us to write equivalent forms of code that mean the same thing, right? And then what we can do is we can use the probabilistic channel to model how a human might read it, right? Because kind of the whole business, uh, you know, the rigor model I gave you, the conditional probability is that that's actually a good way to model how people read code, right? So that is code that's unlikely is harder to read, right? So the probabilistic model gives that theory that we can then verify. And the ability to create equivalent forms gives us an experimental affordance so that we can create experimental topics to do that study, right? So, you know, so this was a really cool kind of interaction and, you know, I'm kind of very excited about this line of work and it's part of our proposal that we recently got funded. Um, and in fact, right now, we just recently hired a PhD student in psycholinguistics to, to work with us. 
Okay, so so this is the idea, right? So you know, you, you predict using the probabilistic model, which of the equivalent forms of chord would be preferable to human being, right? We can predict that, and then we can get a bunch of humans. You know, this is the hard part. You know, IRB approvals and all that stuff, and then you can sort of do this experiment to see the human beings. Uh, can we predict which human beings would like and which one they'd find easier to read? Um, uh, so 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 right so. You know, uh, why, why would a software engineer care about this, right? Uh, well, you know, if you can find code in your corpus that through meaning preserving transforms, you can rewrite to make it more readable, then, you know, it's going to save maintenance time, right? So that's sort of the kind of the actionability argument. It didn't work, but <laughs> we tried. <laughs> but anyway, so that's, that's, the, uh, that's the idea of this book, right? Okay. So, and again, just to sort of quickly recap, right? The idea is that, you know, there's a sort of, noisy channel process that's going on where the programmer guesses a meaning given some code and then like they try to see if you know what they think the code is doing is what is actually doing by looking at the sort of the patterns in the code and if it is they you know they they win they just keep trying and iterating through this loop right so that's sort of the the model of what i what the the, the rough model that i showed you earlier right okay so um so this you know all comes down to this right is which is the most likely a way to write the code given the meaning, right? So, so the first experiment was like basically followed from that model and you know, sort of developed this theory around it, right? So, you know, given like a variety of ways to implement a particular computation, right? So there's like seven different ways to implement a computation, right? Fine. What usually happens is that the programmer would have a strong, right? Because that's a sort of more cooperative thing to do, right? The more sort of socially adept programming, right? And, you know, so it's like you're going to write a code where other people are not going to understand, not going to uh, write code in a way that other people are going to try to understand you, right? So if you're not doing that, you're just trying to impress somebody, right? Look at this cool way I can use pointers or, you know, monads or something to do this thing that you could write in five seconds in a for loop, right? You're just trying to make it complicated for somebody else, right? So, so that's sort of the theory, right? The end, this first experiment that we did, right? So there is, there is kind of a way in which people prefer it, right? And furthermore, that we can model this probability, right? So we can use standard kinds of modeling techniques from machine learning to model this probability, right? So we can predict which one the human being is going to. So yes. I was again involved in the first background. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, so uh, uh, any, you know, so a functional programmer might prefer to read the same algorithm in recursive format. A programmer might prefer a different reading of it. Absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it's really dependent on the culture, right? So, so if you're going to if you're going to take a Haskell corpus and rewrite to become more readable, then your probabilistic model should be trained on the Haskell corpus, right? Um, I love Haskell, by the way. <laughs> no, no slight intended. I teach it. <laughs> okay, so, um, so, um, so, okay, so, um, so, so, can a language model, you know, uh, predict which of several different forms is preferred in an unseen corpus, right? So, I have a bunch of code in a corpus. Can a language model, which was not trained on that corpus, has never seen this corpus before, can it predict which one of the being would prefer, right? That's the first question. Um, so, um, uh, can a language model predict an unseen corpus, which way of writing it is more frequent, right? So that's a different one. Being trained on one corpus, here's another corpus that it hasn't seen before. Can a language model say, in this corpus I haven't seen before, which of the forms of the same computation would be more likely to be seen, right, than another form? Right. So it's a different question because it's a corpus related question as, to, as opposed to human being preference question. And finally, which, which is the, mo the last one is in some sense, the most important one, can language will predict which one the human being would find easiest to read, right? Okay, so those are the questions we, we, we looked at. So again, you know, the, the, the first one is a corpus question. The second one is a human subject question. And so is the third one, All right? So, okay, so the general scheme is you know, so you go off and you estimate a language model. So all of our experiments were, were in Java. So, you know, I, I can't tell you much about other languages. So although my suspicions it would hold up in other languages as well. Um, so use the language model to measure the surprisal of a natural program that is not in the training set, right? So you take a program that the language model hasn't seen before, 
basically one over probabilities, right? So low probable programs are very surprising. That's why they call them surprising. It's a linguistics term. Um, and high probability programs are low surprising. Right? Um, so measure the surprisal, and then you apply meaning preserving transforms to generate variance of S1, S2, S3. Right? So these are all the same computation, but expressed in different ways. Right. Using the language model, you measure the surprisal of the original program and all the mutants. Right. And so if the null hypothesis is if, if the developer is like a computer, they don't care which way you write it. All looks the same to them. They don't have any preference between any of them. Right. And if the, it, 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 the alternative hypothesis, if the if S is lower in surprisal than the others, then programs would clearly have a definite. It's, we're saying they would always prefer the highest, the lowest surprisal, highest probability version of the code. Okay, so so the, the so you know this is the cool part. Again, I don't want to bore you with this, but this is the cool part of this experiment for from a linguist. Do this right. You can sort of generate these equivalent forms very easily. Okay, um, so meaning preserving transforms, you know, nothing terribly surprising. Uh, you know, commutative operators can be swapped. We can remove parentheses which are superfluous. We can add parentheses that are superfluous. We can rename variables. Um, none of these really, you know, will, will change the meaning. So we can do any of these to generate equal forms. Right, so, you know, so in general, um, you know, what we see is that like, you know, uh, you know, when you do uh, swaps, um, you know, this is this is this is looking at the corpus, right? So this is not a human subject study. That is, you know, just look at like you look at occurrences of operators in an unseen corpus, and you apply a meaning preserving transform to make them look different. And what you would expect that is, on average, the preferred form, right? So if you make if you mess with it while not changing it, it should, the probability should go up, and that's by and large what you see. Um, it mostly goes up if you mess with it. Um, um, and so, um, so, you know, there's a lot of results in this particular domain, but in general, what we find is that language models can capture developer preference within a corpus. Okay. Um, the, the next thing is, 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 is our human subject study. So this is all done in mechanical Turk. Um, so, so each Turker was presented with about 80 forced choice questions, like do you prefer this form or this form, right? Um, and then, you know, so please select which of the following two code fragments you prefer. So this is the way they were presented with questions. Um, and, you know, and then we explained what we mean by prefer is that we mean the snippet better reflects the way you'd prefer to code that expression or reflects the form you'd find easier to read than to understand. So we don't make a sort of commitment here to whether it's a this language production side issue or a comprehension side issue. It just says either way, which one would you prefer to see, right? Or, 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 or write. So, um, so this was, uh, you know, so this is kind of, um, we, so, so in this we, had, um, the comprehension study, uh, so that was the, that was a preference study and the comprehension study, which was separate, they were presented with a code sample and asked to compute the result after the execution. So they're sort of mentally simulating the execution of the code in their head. Um, you know, again, we're trying to see whether, you know, the probability of the code makes a difference in their ability to understand the code. So if they behave like a computer, should make any damn difference, right? So, uh, so again, in this setting, we measured the correctness of their answer, the time they took to answer the first question, and the time they took to answer the last question. Right. So, you know, this might be something like this, right? So, you know, two forms of the same source code, and then we might ask them something like, if ours equals three, what is the result? Something like that. Right? Um, so, okay. So, so the human comprehension study was also. Uh, done on mechanical Turk, and you know what we're trying to measure is like does the surprisal affect the time and the correctness of the answers? Right. So essentially, the result summary. So language models can really um, human subjects prefer. So if you take a majority agreement, they are seventy five percent accurate in predicting human subjects' uh, preference. Um, and better language model can predict majority agreement better. So this is kind of really cool. There's a new paper in PNAS. With the same results for for natural language, that is like the better language models are better at predicting how people be, understand and comprehend language. Um, so so this is kind of cool. This basically says the more you improve your language models, they're better at predicting human preference in 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 code, right? Um, so so th the other thing that was kind of cool was that you know if you look at the corpus, there's plenty of places where language models can tell you you should rewrite this code to improve the readability, right? If you believe that readability is probability of the code according to our analysis, 
you can definitely find lots of places in the corpus where we, you can rewrite the code. Now we haven't submitted any pull requests, but you know the potential apparently is there. Okay, so um, so as far as comprehension, both the time of comprehension and the performance worsens with higher entropy, which basically means that the more impossible the code, the people have a harder time comprehending it and reading it. Right. So essentially, the argument you know we're making is that language models can help rewrite code. Okay, so um, so time to last action increases statistically significantly with entropy. Um, uh, the correctness decreases significantly for fill in the blanks tasks. They are true and false answers and fill in the blanks tasks. So the correctness decreases significantly with fill in the blanks answers. And for a correctness, you know, we don't have any enough data or enough statistical effect to actually capture that. So you know, this study is you know will 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 benefit from replication. We have a new study which we just started, which is to sort of look at whether code uh, code probability affects the ability of programmers to find bugs. Right, so are they more likely to find bugs in more readable code or less readable code? So we're, we're doing this kind of starting. Right? So this is kind of an exciting application of this bimodality. So anyway, to, so this is sort of the research mission um, and we have a bunch of different things we're looking at, including other ways of training, um, potential for using reinforcement learning. There's a bunch of different uh, directions we're sort of hoping to explore with this. So I think that's all I had. Let me, Questions or question? Yes. So, what was the reason for using AMP nodes and the open source level where you're going to be using any kind of system? For example, what would be kind of like our time to speak to that would be? So, so are you asking about the first part of the talk or the human comprehension study? The first one. Okay. So, so what was the alternative to the STC in it? Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Oh, why did we use? Why did we not parse? Why did we parse the code to ASTs rather than going directly to intermediate representation? So, the goal of our work was basically to correct. Uh, syntax errors, right? So we weren't trying to kind of do anything with something more complex than that. So we're just basically saying, can we produce correct syntax from this code? If not, which part of the code is wrong? That was the first step. Yes. I've been um, recently getting into the literature on uh, test-based generation, and, and but I also know that there is like, um, code repair, automatic code repair, and other kinds of algorithmic ways of producing code. Right. And, and, and it seems to me like, at least the, the, what I've read so far, when they try to get into any field, is I don't see many people evaluating whether humans actually like this generated code and that they end up committing it to their repos. And I, when I see that the ways that they're, they're doing genetic crossovers and things like that to produce new code that reveals new errors or whatever, I have to imagine it's not very natural. Like it just, it, it would probably end up looking kind of random because it actually is. And I wonder, is there, would, I suppose you could perform, I, I'm, I'm seeing this and I'm getting all these ideas, like you could do these syntax preserving transformations. Semantics preserving. And then you can evaluate which ones actually may be more acceptable to humans. And maybe you could run a study to see if pull requests were accepted more often with with the one that you know. yeah there was some i mean that's a really good point there was work much earlier that you know looked at like pull requests which are being accepted or rejected and so you know using a language model to see if you can predict which pull requests to be accepted there seemed to be some signal there but as far as the automatic patching, sort of patching tools i mean there's a lot of that field is now like very controversial a lot of people argue that it doesn't actually work with yeah. you know sort of this evolution of these search-based patching doesn't work there's some evidence that it does. Um, so I think you know I think it would certainly be interesting if you can find a successful patch that passes the static analysis warning or the test cases or whatever it is you give give it to try to rewrite it to make it more readable. I think that certainly makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, there are also people now like sort of using these probabilistic models to sample the space of possible patches, right? 
So if you use the probabilistic model to sample the space, it's possible that you end up with code that looks more natural because it is based on actual code. Uh, the general problem with a lot of code is very hard to produce even compiling code from right, probabilistic exactly. models. Yeah, right. yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, uh, so, let me turn to the other question. Are you asking whether the same approach would work in different languages? Or? Well, yes, but do you have a view about whether it's like a better result because it's in quite different languages? Yeah, I think so. I mean, my feeling is like, you know, Haskell programs are very short, right? Uh, or, you know, in general, functional programs are very short. Languages don't have type declarations are shorter, like Python is shorter than Java. So, and these languages have a lot of trouble with big scopes, right? So, you know, languages that people use short variable names, so you don't have to split them up. You know, in many of these settings, you have to split variable names up because they're too long for the models. Like, they get too high, but if you have a language where the programs are short and have limited vocabulary, you're certainly going to get better results. But then in those languages, do you have enough training data? I don't know. A C is, for example, is certainly less verbose than Java. Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks for the talk. I was curious, in, in the last part of your talk, you had talked about uh, making code more readable. Right. And, and I can see how that can benefit like people who are reading the code. But I was curious how you think about um, the, the code creator and whether the code writer, how would they perceive the rewritten code? Right. So people might have certain practices or information-based code and how they write code. Um, do you have any sense of what they think of the Oh, I mean, we're doing a study. I don't really know. It's a good question. Um, so, you know, for example, like every different companies have different coding practices. So, you know, a code that's perfectly acceptable at Google may not be at Facebook because it's a bit different. Google has their own coding policy, which I think like should include shame on me. <laughs> but you know, just so they learn how to use some coding style checker. But so you know that's a, that's certainly one thing that you know that might affect how code is viewed by a developer. The other thing is that an individual may have particular preferences or reading styles. So if you take that code which they wrote in a way that they can understand and you rewrite it in a way that they don't understand it, that's certainly not a code. You know, I don't know how long how often that happens. Again, this is a theory. My theory is that based on, you know, so the best models right now for English, and this has not changed in the last 10 years that I've been in the field, the best models for English are about two topics, which means about eight times less probable. They're eight times less good than code models, right? So code is much more constrained. Even if you take just the identifiers, the legal and the syntax, just take the identifiers, just the variable names, right? Code is still more predictable. In English, you drop all the prepositions, conjunctions, pronouns, the close category words. You drop them, and you just have the nouns, words, um, uh, adjectives, adverbs, right? You just leave those in there, and then code you just leave the identifiers in. Even if you do that, code is almost twice as predictable as English. So I think because code is harder to read, you know, people just take much less risks with how they're going to express themselves, right? I mean, there probably is code poetry, but I'm not aware. <laughs> so, so I think people are just much, much less adventurous in the way they write code, which is sort of a shame because you know beautiful code is as much an, as a delightful aesthetic experience as beautiful anything. You know, and but you know, you know we tend not to emphasize emotional experience. You know, more is a shame. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe one more question, and then we'll we'll take our questions for the social hour after. Yeah, that's a really good observation. That's kind of what we're doing right now, but not quite the way you put it. Um, 
you know, so what we're doing is, you know, it turns out that if you write English in a very natural way, like a native English speaker, um, and if you are kind of a fluent reader of English, so there's some members of my family are just like this. So if I want to find grammatical errors in my writing, I give it to them because they're so quick at finding the grammatical errors. They just get stuck on it. I just go off because I'm a fluent reader and not just like this. So, so, um, so in the same way, I think that fluently written course will hide bugs. That's hypothesis we're experimenting on right now. So we're trying to design some human subject studies to see whether that's the case. Will experience otherwise fluent is really important. So we have a way of measuring the fluency of these course. And then so we hope to get a variance there on, you know, some people who read course fluently and some people who don't. And see if the ones who are particularly more fluent are more likely to have bugs that are written in the same style. I don't know if that's what you were getting at, but yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, it also may be the case that if you have buggy chords, right, if you think there's some buggy chord in, in a method, then rewriting that method in a really convoluted way might make it more easy to find out. I don't know. It's another possibility. <laughs> okay, well, um, so if anybody else has any more questions, you just want to kind of converse. Um, we have the social hour outside here. Um, so please come and join us for some uh, refreshments and discussion. Well, thank you to our guest, Professor.